It is January the 20th and this is Curiously Polar. Hello back, Henry. How are you doing today? <laughs> Better than yesterday. Okay, How are you? So, <laughs> yeah, we're hanging in there. It's, it's um, the, uh, interestingly enough, this is the 20th of January 2021, but uh, this is not related to the date that we're recording, but to the fact that uh, the, the internet is, is against us and this is the third time we're trying to record this episode. That's the length we go for you, the audience. We are, uh, yeah, we're doing our best to bring you an episode. I think that's the, the, the longest uh, we, we ever try to record an episode so far. Uh, it is, it is. And um, it, we, we're, not, we're not giving up. Okay, so, yeah, the, the whole thing is <laughs> a, bit, a bit, I'd say a bit shaky sometimes. Um, but we are, we're, this is the third time is the charm. So, let's see, what are we, what do we have here? Today, I think you want to take us back to the Antarctic. Um, I would love to, yes. Still in Antarctic summer season, so let's get back there. Yeah, but before that, I want to take us to the Antarctic, because I found something exactly. just a few <laughs> days ago that I found interesting, that piqued my interest, and I thought, why not um, bring it here? And that is a photo let me bring that up on the screen here. A photo of the uh, Antarctic Peninsula. No, not at, at the end of our Antarctic continent. <laughs> the peninsula and the continent and everything around it. And um, it's an interesting photo because it's from outer space. And it has gone a bit viral on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, in connection with, uh, with, a sci with scientists, uh, warnings of rapid melting of Antarctica's uh, Thwaites Glacier, uh, and yeah, it 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 made its rounds because you can you can see a lot of detail on it. You see the it's, it's a really really great picture. You see the entire continent. You see the Transantarctic Mountains, which actually cut the continent in half. You see the sea ice, the the slightly brighter white layer around. Uh, the continent. It's amazing. You even can distinguish between the ice sheets on the landscape, on the geography, and the shelf ices, which yes. are on sea level. It's really a brilliant picture. And it's also from an interesting perspective, because it's from outer space, obviously. You can see the Earth's atmosphere being very thin, of course. You can see um, and, and it's tilted sideways. Normally, you would depict that to be on the bottom of the Earth, but in this case, they tilted it 90 degrees so it's on the side and yeah I, I saw this and I, I went like hmm this looks almost too perfect for a photo and <laughs> it, it kind of is because <laughs> if you've seen satellite pictures well first of all that satellite would be would have to be very low uh, very high above the earth it, um if you look at where like the ISS is at I don't know three four hundred kilometers above the earth you would never see that kind of a view from uh, from that low uh, Earth orbit, so it's probably a satellite who is doing its last picture on the disposal orbit. Yes, on the on the um, on the graveyard orbit. That's it. Graveyard, exactly. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, it's not. It's not because it turns out, and I did a bit of research. I spent maybe half an hour digging into this. Uh, it turns out it is not a real photo. It's computer generated. It is a fake picture. <laughs> so now we now we should be shocked and go oh no they partially, are partially they're messing with us but it's not quite a fake picture you're right uh, because this picture was made in 2005 as part of the international polar year by the NASA scientific visualization studio and uh, not just that they made four pictures so um, let's just have a quick look at that um, bringing up the um, the visualization studios web side and uh yes this is um to this is a view of the antarctic on september the 21st 2005 so uh what they've done is well first of all they've created a pair of photos so one is from uh the north pole and the other is from the south pole and when they did it they did it right side up also so they turned it so uh, that you're looking at it down onto the earth pretty much um but not just that they 
used scientific data um, for the sea ice color. They used uh, actual cloud cover data from, I think, 2002. Um, they, uh, they used scientific information to create that. So it's based on real data. And they just made it look really nice as opposed to a lot of the satellite images that need a lot of cleanup. And they, they made it almost look perfect. You have a, a perfectly clear view onto the continent. It's and usually not never the that way. <laughs> it, exactly. It's the entire southern hemisphere, which you uh, can see. You see the oceans and you see some slight uh, cloud uh, blur on the ocean. If that would be proper clouds, you wouldn't see the continent. And that's the, yes. the major difference here from, from regular satellite pictures and this beautiful graphic. It, it's really um, highlighted the continent and the, and the sea ice. Yeah. And not just that, they, uh, they, as I said earlier, they made four photos. So they made one from the North Pole, one from the South Pole, and then they also made pictures of the stars behind those as as on the 21st of September 2005. So they made it like this would be the star lit sky from that location with the earth in front. So you can take those and, and, and composite them together and then you have a, a scientifically correct view of the whole thing. And uh, on that website, again, oh, by the way, those photos are... Uh, NASA photos in, I think, the public domain, so it's fine to use them in any context. If you want to use that South Pole picture or that North Pole picture, uh, go ahead and do that. Um, and they even tell you who it was. It's Cindy Starr is the lead visualizer on that, and Ronald Weaver is a scientist on that who did it. And then there's all, it also says, please give credit for this item to NASA Goddard Space Flight Center Visual Scientific Visualization Studio, the blue marble data which is also part of that uh, picture, is courtesy of Reto Stockley, who is also at the Goddard Space Flight Center. So there you go. It's, an, Here's it's a great source. You have the, the short URL down there. We put it into yeah. the show notes, of course. Um, the, the Scientific Visualization Studio is really a, a wonderful source if you need to visualize scientific information for for me holding lectures for example on board of uh, of the expedition cruise ships that's one of my uh, primary sources of amazing yeah. graphics of amazing visualizations really really great source yes oops that's not supposed to run <laughs> the technology it's 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 not meant to be but okay um we are moving on but on to what, why one, one question before we move on is why do you think they, they have animated that and not just use satellite pictures? It's not only because of the clouds, isn't it? You mean why, why, they, why they visualized that? Well, yes. no, you tell me. It's just imagine the, um, all the factors that come together. You sat that in the beginning. Um, your introduction was that the satellite would need to fly in a very, very... Um, high altitude, uh, very high orbit around True. Earth. That's one thing. So you would have numerous pictures you need to stitch together to get oh, yeah, a total general, picture yes. of Antarctica. That's, that's one thing. The other thing is that satellites usually don't take photographs as we perceive <laughs> photographs we take with a DSLR. Very true. It looks rather different, and most of them have uh, infrared uh, sensors and stuff in there. So the pictures looks slightly different and for people who are not used to that it's very difficult to identify let's say landscapes or continents or distinguish between sea ice and uh, an ice covered continent so what the visualization studio does here is takes off this tra uh, transfer it just gives you already a picture you are kind of used to that's how we see how we perceive the planet how we perceive pictures and gives us it as easy as possible. So we don't have to invert colors in our brain. We don't have to give eyes um, a white color instead of a, of a red one, for example. Mm -hmm. And this, this is like the big, big challenge in scientific communication that you actually make it accessible for just ordinary people who are not part of the academic world or not part of that specific scientific 
um, department. I, I follow a, an account on Twitter who uh, is like a, a European ESA account and uh, they post a picture of the sun every morning just to greet everyone. But it's a picture of the sun in a very specific wavelength. So one day it's green, one day it's yellow, one day it's red, and you get the, like kind of the different views at different w wavelengths of the sun. And of course, it doesn't look anything like the sun. So yeah, visualization is important. It's important to make uh, science, um, to allow people to, to see science as it would be seen in your everyday life. Yeah, and just exactly make the connection of what scientists actually do. And when we talk about NASA, we always think it's about going to the moon and it's about um, going to Mars. It's not. It's of, it's about understanding our planet. And a lot of NASA's daily business has to do with climate research, with research about glaciers and um, about oceans and so on. And the visualization studio here does a very, yeah. very terrific job to to combine all of those different disciplines and just communicate science in a very easy to understand way. Pretty amazing. Yeah. So while we are in Antarctica, why don't you kick us off on the second topic of the day? You have some... We just take it from there. Yeah. <laughs> What what's what's <laughs> happening though? What's going on? What's going on? The episode is called United in Peace, Research at the End of the World. And I would just love to take it from the visualization studio to everyday um science in Antarctica and would just really love to give a little insight about research on the seventh continent and You've heard about NASA already a little bit. There are so many different institutes and so many different countries involved. When you uh, remember the Antarctic Treaty we talked about in the very, very beginning of this podcast, we might just follow up with a with an update uh, some sometime soon. But it started in 1959 in December when the 12 original signees just put their signatures under the Antarctic Treaty, putting the continent under the domination of peace and science. No military allowed, no military operations, no nuclear operations or anything. Only science on that um, continent. Later, other countries joined for today a total of 54 countries. And those 54 countries all operate research stations on the continent. Just imagine that. And most of the countries don't only operate one research station, but two, three, or even more. 18 of those countries operate, uh, operate year-round research stations. And this is the amazing thing when you see how everything comes together. And United in Peace, what the, the title of the episode uh, amplifies, is the big question of if we actually um, can, can come together on a completely uninhabited continent and just peacefully use it as a research base or a research opportunity for mankind. And if you are on YouTube, you see um, on the on the screen now a beautiful map of Antarctica. It's an outline. You see the continent shape and you see different colors there. You have white, purple and red. The purple areas are completely untouched by mankind. There's no man been so far, no scientific, no exploration operation there, nothing. And you see opposite the, uh, the, the red color, the red color is where has been human activity recorded. So you can see the vast majority of activity happens around the peninsula. Why is that, Chris? Why do you think the, the biggest impact of human um, activity in Antarctica is on the peninsula. Because oh, that's the easiest one to reach. I mean, all the ships land there and uh, the ship connections are still probably the most important connections to Antarctica. So yeah, that's where you would come uh, arrive from Argentina. Exactly. And it's also the part of the continent that reaches the furthest north. Right. Speaking, it goes out of the polar circle. And that also means it's more accessible. That means the sea ice retreats earlier and it creates it forms later. So you have a bigger window of accessibility there. And you actually can place research facilities on a solid ground, not on ice. When you see the other um, red dots around the continent, you see they are mainly 
on the coastlines. And they're so very they're tiny, trying... by the way, on this picture. Just everyone, those little sprinkles here, that's the red dots we're talking about. So uh, it's it's hard to see, but it means everything, everything that's red is human touched, right? Exactly. You can see where we left kind of a footprint, no matter what the activity used to be. And it doesn't mean that there is something left to see. It just means there has been someone already. And you see that the the um, facilities, they are a little bit crouched on the, on the coastline. And that means they try to find either ice-free spots to put something on, but also make it as easy accessible as possible. So access, as Chris already said, mainly do ships. That means you need to offload everything on the continent. And the further inland your um, research station is, the longer the transfer from the coast to the research station. Just if you remember, we talked about the Vostok station, the Russian station a few episodes ago. It's about three and a half thousand kilometers that needs to be transported from the coast where it's offloaded from the ship to the actual research station. That's a long stretch, which you can't really just go on a highway, go 100 miles per hour. It actually takes quite some time to transport goods from A to B. So that's a, a big, big impact. What you also can see is that we have outside of the peninsula quite one center, and that's at the bottom of the continent here in that picture. That's the area of the Ross Sea. You see the area where the US station, McMurdo Station is, the largest research facility on the continent. In summertime, uh, we have over a thousand people in McMurdo Station. Are working on several projects on Ross Island and in the same vicinity you have also the Scott station or Scott base from New Zealand so you have like the the epicenter of science on one hand on the around the peninsula and on the other hand at Ross at the Ross Sea and now you also um, might keep in mind that all of the 12 um, out of the 12 signees uh, of the um, Antarctic Treaty, we have a number of countries, uh, a number actually seven, who previously claimed territory in the uh, on the seventh continent. And all those seven countries actually operate not only one research station, but a number of research stations to support their claims. And here comes something into place where the question mark in the title of the episode at United in Peace gets an explanation. Just imagine that research basically should serve all mankind, but you also can just you know, just build a research facility as kind of a of a uh, standing to say I am here. This is my territory. You just underline your claim, and that's what happened. And recently, and that's why we actually try to um, outline this a little bit more in this episode, we've seen that tensions have been rising between, on one hand, Australia as one of the claim, claiming states for the Antarctic, uh, Australian Antarctic Territory, and China as a signing of the Antarctic Treaty, but not as a claiming state, claiming country. So China has started to build a number of um, uh, research stations in the area or in the territory that's claimed by Australia. So Australia gets very, very careful here and yeah, questions Chinese, uh, Chinese um, um, purpose. Why, why is China building those stations there? What do they um, plan in the long run? So the answer from Australia a few years ago was to think about a new infrastructure project. And I just ask you, Chris, have you heard about a new infrastructure project in Antarctica recently? Well, I have because this is the third time we're trying to record this episode. <laughs> so, yes, I have. But um, I'm pretty sure most of our listeners have not. So um, fill us in here. Infrastructure project sounds a little bit dubious in the first place. You think, does, okay, yeah. they might they might just extend uh, existing research facilities. They're actually not. The, research, uh, the, the infrastructure project, they are actually proposing to the Antarctic uh, Treaty 
um, consultating, uh, consultation meeting, which is like kind of the governing body of Antarctica, is a new airport. And when I say airport, it sounds like a thing you might know from the US, from Australia, from, from Europe, just like a regular commercial airport. It pretty much is planned okay. as such. Okay, okay. Let, let me let me just uh, set set the scene. So when we're looking at Antarctica and at airplanes, and airplanes do land there, there is uh, people and 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 goods brought in by airplane for sure. But um, what we're talking about is mostly airfields, like a stretch of uh, something on either on ice or on land, but typically on ice, I would say. That uh, where where planes land and maybe some infrastructure next to it in form of some smaller buildings and something, that's that would be my expectation from what I've seen uh, landing in Greenland, for example, which is way more uh, <laughs> way fuller, much fuller of infrastructure than Antarctica probably is. So currently we have some twenty some existing airfields in mm -hmm. Antarctica, all operated by member nations. And all those runways that are composed, as you um, actually rightly stated, by uh, of ice, blue ice, snow, more rarely gravel. So it means the vast majority of those runways are situated on the ice sheet. That means that for the airplanes landing there, you have to have some very special uh, weather conditions. You have to have a clear view. There is no um, supporting equipment that guides you uh, with an autopilot down to the uh, to, to the ice, basically to the ice run, uh, runway. So the setup here will oh, is generally different, and they are scattered all around the, the continent. And we put up uh, a map actually um, on on uh, our video version of the YouTube uh, of the uh, podcast, where you actually see the whole operation of a medevac that happened around Christmas time. We briefly talked about that. An Australian scientist um, needed a medevac, a, a medical evacuation, and that caused a huge fuss around um, yeah, several, yeah, several different nations to get involved because simply there were no um, capacities to get him quickly uh, back to Hobart off the continent. And that's what we always talk about when we also go there with the expedition cruise ships. There are no um, hospitals. There are no clinics um, in Antarctica, so you have to be prepared to actually either treat that on board or in within your facility, or be ready for a medevac. And medevacs are rather rare, actually. So here we can actually see on that map, um, yeah, how the the flights have been conducted. So usually. The flights from Hobart are coming to the Wilkins Airfield, which is um, like 60 kilometers away from Casey Station. Casey Research Station in East Antarctica is kind of the incoming hub for people coming from Australia. From there, smaller planes, um, bar slot planes, um, bring them from Casey to Davis or uh, Mawson Station, which is 1,400, 2,000 something kilometers. So you have to hop on um, a plane coming from a long intercontinental flight. So this is the uh, the, the basic setup, what they try to um, reduce. And you can now see when we zoom out, sorry, when we zoom out a little bit, you can see um, all the stretch to uh, South Tasmania, where Hobart, the, the, the epicenter for Australia um, in terms of, Antarc of the Antarctic Division is um, headquartered. So now the idea is to actually build um, a physical runway, a paved runway on an ice-free stretch close to Davis Station. So the two largest stations uh, of Australia are the Davis Station and uh, Mawson. And at Davis Station, there has been um, some assessment going on um, in the area uh, around the station. And we put up a map of the proposed Davis Aerodrome. And you can see the tiny little uh, sparkles on the left bottom of the picture. That's Davis uh, Research Station. And then you have this massive stretch of the runway, 2.7 kilometers long, 45 meters wide. It's capable 
of having C-130 Hercules military machines going down there or Boeing 787 Dreamliners. That's humongous aeroplanes. And then you have next to that runway, it's not only the runway they're actually planning, they're planning huge facilities around that. So apron buildings, a control, flight control tower, a uh, access road four and a half kilometers down to Davis Research Station. So this is a huge, huge project in a scale that's never been conducted in Antarctica. And, and here it, comes... It, and it's hard to do these kind of things down there. I mean, this is a, an environment that is very harsh and very... Uh, doesn't lend itself to just building an airport, but this is pretty much what they're doing, right? That's exactly the point. Or planning. Here comes the... The difficulties, if you want to plan a paved runway in that area, which is ice-free, so there there is no um, ice sheet coming down or glacier, it's really an ice-free area, but it means that you need to ship in all the stuff to that area. Given the capacities of, of the ships and also the capacity of manpower there, that would A, reduce the signs uh, cap uh, capacities of Davis tremendously because all those construction workers need to be housed somewhere. And mm -hmm. secondly, it would also mean that those numerous tons heavy concrete items need to be play uh, need to be shipped in and then placed there somehow. So we have a huge, huge impact in a way that we act have for the very first a huge outcry in the science community and funny enough in the Australian science community and that's a little bit interesting because this runway is supposedly made especially for Australian scientists. What Australia argues here is that it will be the very first um, airport in Antarctica that allows us to access the continent much much more frequent it allows scientists to actually much quicker rotate uh, on the research stations. It gives a much better um, allowance to bring logistics down to Antarctica. It gives a much better access. But at the same time, just to give you two numbers here, it would increase Australia's footprint on the continent from roughly 4% to almost 40%. It's a huge impact and we have a, a, a graphic that two Australian scientists came up with who actually uh, wrote a very um, passionate paper about that and you can see, oh it's 6% uh, right now by the way, sorry. Um, Australia's current footprint is around 6% and with the new aerodrome Australia would overtake the United States as the largest footprint a nation on the continent, the United States with McMurdo um, right now 24% of uh, a footprint and it would actually even include two-thirds of the Argentinian footprint as well. So we put, uh, we're talking about a very very massive impact on the continent. So people would ask, who cares, nobody's living there isn't that? It's a very, very fragile ecosystem we're talking about. And particularly the area they are proposing the airfield in is one of the most important ice-free areas in Antarctica. That's one of the very, very few areas where we actually have a lot of opportunities to research ice-free environments in the uh, southern polar area. And that's something we can't just replace. If we see the research facilities on the continent, they are vastly temporarily. They are built in a way that they can be yeah, just unbuilt or wrapped down rather quickly and just taken off the continent, which is part of the Antarctic Treaty. This airport has no chance of building it down to a way that there will be no impact visible any longer. So let me... Let me just make this clear, because because um, I mean, yeah, the Antarctic is huge, it's big and everything, but um, the the thing I read several times about this is that the Antarctic is, is kind of the last real wilderness on this planet. So 
Um, what you do by building something like that is you destroy part of that, and uh, you might even you might even start a race uh, for I don't know the biggest airport in Antarctica or something. Um, so so this is a proposal right now. Correct. It's a proposal. Yes, it uh, will be debated in May in the next ATCM uh, Antarctic Treaty cons uh, consulting or consultative meeting uh, in in May in Paris, if I'm not wrong. And uh, I'm I'm really curious about the um, the outcome. Yeah, what what the other treaty members uh, will say about that. That's that's really interesting. Um, I read a lot of um, voices from the science community. But that's not necessarily the decision makers in the ATCM. So that's something very difficult to forecast. But what we see here is that the, the group of people um, for whom that airport supposedly ha has been planned really steps back and says, we have to find a balance between the intended outcome of our science projects, of our research, and the footprint we are leaving. And you can see that a lot of those scientists are not happy with the footprint this project creates on the continent. And this is very, very interesting to see in terms of geopolitics, because a number of scientists claim that the intentionally purpose for Australia here is not science driven, but geopolitics driven to underline a territorial claim. We know that the Antarctic Treaty has been uh, debated and discussed recently in a number of countries. And we see here that the threat of China building new research facilities in the, um, in the territory that's claimed by Australia and Australia now takes the next move and wants to build a permanent um, presence, and not only a research presence, but a permanent infrastructural presence. And that's clearly, in the vast majority, a geopolitical move rather than a science-supporting move. So it's debate. It's going to be debated in May 2021. Um, is there any idea about the outcome of that debate? Is that debate? going to have a binding result or is that just something that yeah will continue for another few years until a decision is made and who makes that decision the itcm so the the consultative meeting is uh, doing that decision and if the meeting decides against the project there is no real chance for australia to pursue it properly it, there is a big question mark so we don't really have kind of a of a police um, that enforces that. It's, it really um, relies on the nations respecting the decisions of the treaty. So that makes this very, very difficult, very, um, yeah, very hard to grasp. So let's play a little bit um, with, with some, some ideas and just say Australia would still be that airport that would set a precedent and that precedent would be obviously followed by other nations when Australia would just back out of the treaty then other countries would and then we see we will definitely see um, a run for Antarctica in a number of ways and that's not only scientific that will be including mining it will be fishing it will be uh, whaling so there's a, a lot of um, things going on in the geopolitical sphere here as well which we have to consider there as well but i kind of doubt that australia would undertake um, any such move uh, if the consultative meeting would reject that proposal rather australia would follow um the possibility of um work or update um enhance the proposal and hand it in again i think that would be like the next step so my question to you is, is there any way for our listeners to do anything? I mean, we, I think we can agree that the, it's not a good idea to build this kind of an airfield. I think that's the tone you might have heard, or listeners might have heard from us. Um, but is there, are there like things like online petitions or any other things that uh, people could do? Maybe contact their governments about it and let them know that they should not vote for this airfield what's what, what are the ways that we can do anything about it 
I haven't seen an online petition yet. There would be a great chance to actually set one up. But um, what you could do is um, contact your your national um, Antarctic program and just state your uh, your opinion and just tell them that you hardly dislike that and uh, you hope they're not supporting that and not in favor of that. And I'm quite sure that the vast majority of Antarctic programs um, on our planet would not support that, even though it might ease down logistics a little bit, not only for Australia, but also for other Antarctic programs, that's for sure. But the downsides, the the, the cons on, on that decision, they are just so heavily overweighting that I really doubt that this project will kick off. And if that project would be approved just for you to, to, to scale that again, that construction of that project would kick off in 2023 and it would last at least till 2040 just to give you an idea 2040 okay massive huge, undertaking huge, yeah, massive years and years of work indeed. okay <sighs> all right i guess that uh brings us to the end of this episode not much more to say i would love and... to 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 end with one quote and uh that's by one of the leading scientists who opposes that project and his name is uh, Sean Brooks and Sean Brooks is an environmental scientist in Tasmania at the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Studies and he said Antarctica is special everywhere else in the world you measure wilderness by what's left in Antarctica it's still the other way around and that's just something we always should keep in our mind whatever we want to do in Antarctica so Antarctica is precious let's keep it that way Exactly. All right, that brings us to the end of this episode. We hope you enjoyed what we did. And if you have remarks on it or miss a topic or anything like that, let us know. We're online uh, on the Instas and Twitters at Curiously Polar. And of course, you can find us on our website at CuriouslyPolar.com. As usual, all the other episodes there. Um, yeah, I guess that's it for today. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in thanks everyone for your time and we'll see you soon again until then everyone take care